Good morning, boys and girls. Welcome back to our second part of the most dangerous game. Three things that I want to talk about before you uh, begin part two, which is only like 19 minutes left of the reading. Uh, the three things I want to talk about in part one were number one, the build up um, that the author does to just reveal that his hunting is actually murder, that it's actually hunting men, uh, that, that rising action that he builds up on. Uh, number two, also, um, Zaroff explaining to Rainsford, they're both hunters, he's trying to um, get him to understand his philosophy, his theory of why this is a creative and, and, um, and, and justifiable game to play. Um, so we're going to talk about that a little bit. And also, then finally, what is the climax exactly? Where does Rainsford um, change from being the, the hunter... And Zaroff does want to hunt with him to change to become the huntee, where Rainsford, um, Zaroff decides, I'm going to hunt you, Rainsford. Um, we're going to break those things down as well. So first of all, if you go back to page 18 in your text, I'd like to start there. Uh, we actually see the first sign that, um, that Zaroff is excited about having somebody like Rainsford on his island. Um, he says, you know, basically in the second column, we'll have some capital hunting, you and I said the general, I'll be most glad to have your society. Um, and he, But Rainsford is like, but what game? This is the second column on page 18. And he goes, oh, I'll tell you, said the general. You will be most amused, I know, I think I'll say, in all modesty, that I've done a rare thing. I've done something super. I've invented a new game. Okay? And this whole time, um, the author here is kind of building the suspense. We get this rising action, another step, another step. And we, as Rainsford is questioning, what is this new game you're hunting? Um, I think that uh, we, the readers, are also questioning that. What could this game be? Is he genetically created some new animal? What is this new game that he's got? Um, so basically, I want you to turn your page now to page 21, and we still see this build up. The author building the suspense, revealing, not revealing to us yet uh, that, that, that his hunting is actually murder. Top of page 21, first column, he says, So I asked myself, why the hunt no longer fascinated me? You are much younger than I am, Mr. Rainsford, and I have not and I have not hunted as much, but perhaps you can guess the answer. And he's like, what is it? Well, simply this. Hunting ceased to be uh, what you would call a sporting proposition. He says, I've, uh, I've become too good. I needed some new quarry, some new game, some new animal. Down in the middle of the first column on page 21, I had to invent a new animal. And he's like, a new animal. So again... We still don't get this, he's hunting men yet. It's taking two pages now to keep the build up. Um, and basically, uh, he gets to a point where he finally says that, you know, this, that, these, that these are actually men he's hunting. And um, that actually happens on page 21. Uh, and at the top of the second part, he, he's like, he's talking about an animal that can reason. Bottom of page 21 actually starts saying, um, I need a new animal to hunt somebody that's cunning some something that can reason and we think of the only thing that can reason i'm thinking like a um anything of uh, like a chimpanzee uh, i'm thinking is it but chimps aren't sporting the hunt right i need something that can reason and it goes there's no animal that can reason uh but there is one that can my dear fellow we get to the top of the page and this is where rainsford finally understands and maybe you got it before they did that this most dangerous game is actually hunting humans but i love the build-up that we get over three pages of him explaining uh, how he's creative and how he came up with this new game and that Rainsford is going to enjoy doing it with him. And that's the next part I want to talk about. Zaroff, because we need to understand for the climax, we need a turning point. And throughout the rising action, I get, um, you know, Zaroff wanting to hunt, wanting to hunt with Rainsford for him to appreciate his game that he's created. But w at what point is Rainsford no longer a hunter, but a huntee? When does Rainsford, um, when does Zaroff decide he's going to hunt him? That's the next part because that's going to help us decide our, cli our climax. So our second thing I wanted to talk about is Zaroff. He actually tries to reason with him, tries to explain things. Um, I want to, at the bottom of 21 to him, he actually says, Oh, don't worry, I'm not actually hunting just any men. I'm hunting the scum of the earth. And we get this real tone of racism in here. But I don't want to see this as the author publishing or, or um, promoting racism at, at, by any means. Don't forget, Zaroff is our antagonist. He is our evil character. So by saying these things, it should be repulsive to us. He says, don't worry, I'm, I'm hunting the scum of the earth. 
He uses Laskers. Uh, he uses um, blacks, Chinese, and even whites. He even says whites, the scum of the earth, right? So anybody that's not uh, Russian pure at heart, like Zaroff is, is the enemy, is not as fit as him. And he brings up this concept of survival of the fittest. If you are a hunter out there and you're thinking to yourself, hunting is fine, it's reasonable. Um, I have no problems going out and hunting deer. Um, come on, the deer are pretty defenseless. Uh, you've got a gun. You hit, uh, you hide, uh, you're hidden, and, and you wait for the deer to come along, and you shoot them. I mean, it's pretty, it's not very fair. Um, but, of course, I'm a meat eater, so I'm not going to be hypocritical. But, uh, indeed, hunting is a, not a fair sport. And survival of the fittest is a concept that many people rely on. Um, we are humans. Do you believe in survival of the fittest? And this is what Zaroff tries to uh, explain to Rainsford to get him on his side. He's like, I am the strong, I hunt the weak. There's nothing wrong with this. That's at the bottom of page 21. He continues to try to get Rainsford on his side. And he goes, because Rainsford continues to go, I'm a hunter, not a murderer. Right? He goes, oh, come on. Um, I, I give them a fair shot. The second thing is that uh, page 22 in the first column, he actually tries to uh, say, I'm civilized and you shoot down men. And, and we start to get a trace of anger in that, in that first column on page 22, where um, you see Zaroff almost starting to get angry with him because he's not coming to his side. He's not understanding him. And he goes, well, I do train them. I, I obviously, they're, they're ship guys. They're sailors. They don't know anything about the jungle. So he has a training school, which to me, and, and, and you as a reader, you're probably like appalled by this, right? In our, in our last reading, he goes, he trains them, gives them a training school and stuff like that. Um, you know, and, and obviously that, that helps them to learn about the jungle. And then finally, as, as Rainsford's still not convinced, he goes, well, I give him a three hour head start. I give him a knife, a great hunting knife. And I only use a weapon of the smallest caliber. That is at the top of page tw uh, 22 in the second column. And I want to point out how, again, foreshadowing doesn't seem like foreshadowing unless we reread, unless we go back and analyze the text. Um, remember how he picked up that 22, that little bullet that I showed you, the shell from the 22. Here it's revealed that he's hunting these men with only a pistol, a small caliber. So, you know, if you are the, the huntee, you actually got a chance. You know, he's not sitting there like a sniper with a long range rifle. He has to get close. And, and if you're, if you, if you're, um, just as good of a hunter, you know, Rainsford might have a chance here. So, um, Although he still has a gun, the other guy has a knife. I don't think it's fair, um, but he still says survival of the fittest, and he does kind of pull himself back to, to make it fair for the, the, the animal he's hunting, if you will. So anyway, a lot of great things to try to get Rainsford to come to his side, but Rainsford never does. Rainsford never agrees to, um, to understand his hunt, okay? So that night, um, I want to point out, because I'm going to break down just the point right up to the climax. And in the text here, if you look uh, up above here, I'm going to highlight some of the text. He's like, and now, you know, I want you to show you my new collection of heads. Wouldn't you come to the library with me? New collection of heads. Rainsford has come to know that he's hunting humans, and he's in a library, or he's in a room with all sorts of game all around stuffed. And now he wants to show the new heads. And he goes, um... I hope you'll excuse me tonight, General Zaroff. I'm not feeling well. Yeah, I think I would get sick to my stomach going in a room and looking at that collection of heads. Um, he goes, indeed, but watch. Zaroff still thinks, he goes, uh, you need a good restful night's sleep, you know, after your long swim. You'll feel like a new man then, and I'll wager we'll hunt then, eh? I have a, a rather promising prospect, you know, um, and... and you know, I think we, it's, it's important to analyze and realize he still wants Rainsford to hunt with him because we are still on rising action. We haven't come to that turning point yet. So where is it? Rainsford goes into his bed that night, and I love the description here. The bed was good. The pajamas were soft as silk, and he was tired in every fiber of being. But nevertheless, Rainsford could not quiet his brain um, with the opiate of sleep. Great vocab word there. And... Um, you know, even though he's got a soft, comfortable bed, he cannot fall asleep. And the whole night, he's sitting there awake and finally achieves a doze just about morning comes when he hears, far off in the jungle, the faint report of a pistol. We know Zaroff was out hunting all night, and he got another game. Okay, he got another um, animal, if you will. That just 
wakes Rainsford back up, so he's had no sleep this night, right? And the next morning, this is where it's the crucial turning point for Rainsford. He needs to realize who he's dealing with with General Zaroff. And he comes back in, and Zaroff still wants to hunt with him, not hunt him. Watch. He goes, as for me, I do not feel so well. I'm worried, Mr. Rainsford. Last night, I detected traces of my own complaint. His complaint is boredom. These guys are offering him no struggle in the jungle. Uh, they, they, they don't know what they're doing. They leave easy traces. He's able to follow them very well. And don't forget, Rainsford being a hunter knows how to hunt, knows how not to leave traces. So what he's got right in front of him, if he's bored with these other guys to hunt, he has Rainsford who is going to give him a good challenge. And Rainsford doesn't see this. So finally, we get into this and, and Rainsford keeps pushing. I wish to leave this island at once. Okay? And, and again, the, 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 um, the antagonist, you know, uh, General Zaroff says, but dear fellow, the general protested, you've only just come. You've had no hunting. You know, he wants to hunt with him still. And again, Rainsford pushes. I wish to go today, said Rainsford. And notice this little hyphen right here at the end. Boys and girls, that's an interruption. If you don't know this yet, you've got to understand that because this is this is a quick interruption by, by Rainsford to come in. He goes, you, you've had no hunting. I wish to go today. You can see that this is very stern, the way he's, Rainsford says it. And the dead black eyes of the general were on him studying him again, foreshadowing, right? Studying him. And General Zaroff's face suddenly brightened. Boys and girls, there's your climax. Zaroff gets mad. He's offended. And suddenly his face goes, you know what? We will hunt today. Tonight, you and I will hunt. We will. And Rainsford's like, no, General, I will not hunt. And the General goes, well, that's fine, but if you don't want to hunt, I think you'd rather hunt with me than play with Ivan. And we know that if people refuse to hunt, Ivan is going to torture them. And he's like, you don't mean, cried Rainsford, right? My dear fellow, I always mean what I say when I'm talking about hunting. So we know now that Rainsford has changed from the hunter to the huntee. Rainsford pushed it too far. He didn't realize that his host wanted to hunt with him and now has changed his mind because this, and he's like, oh, I think this is going to be a great sport. You know, you'll find this game worth playing. And it's like outdoor chess. And all of a sudden, Zaroff is revived, okay? So what a great buildup. I just want to take a look. I mean, this is a great text where the author very carefully does some building. And a climax is fact that definitive that this climax here is um, this turning point where he decides, I'm going to hunt you instead. And Rainsford goes from being the hunter to the huntee. So we have a turning point for our main character. Although it may not be the most exciting part of the book, it's definitely indeed our climax. So throughout the rest of the book here, the next, next 19 minutes, we get falling action. Okay? And he's going to obviously try to outwin, outwit the, um, the uh, general. Okay, so right about now, I'm going to start up the, the story. If you are in your textbook, which I hope you are, because again, the footnotes are very important. You are at the bottom of page 23. Okay, and I'm going to start up the audio text. I know there was a little echo in there in that audio text. I'm trying not to use the computer's microphone, but just the microphone out here. Um, hopefully that'll get rid of it. Okay, enjoy the rest of the text, boys and girls. I'll see you for five minutes at the end of this video. Chest, you don't mean, cried Rainsford. My dear fellow, said the general, have I not told you I always mean what I say about hunting? We're at the top of page this 24. This is really an inspiration. I drink to a foamed worthy of my steel at last. The general raised his glass, but Rainsford sat staring at him. You'll find this game worth playing, the general said enthusiastically. Your brain against mine. Your woodcraft against mine. Your strength and stamina against mine. Outdoor chess. And the stake is not without value, eh? And if I win, began Rainsford huskily, I'll cheerfully acknowledge myself defeated if I do not find you by midnight of the third day, said General Zaroff. My sloop will place you on the mainland near a town. The general read what Rainsford was thinking. Oh, you can trust me, said the Cossack. I will give you my word as a gentleman and a sportsman. Of course, you in turn must agree to say nothing of your visit here. I'll agree to nothing of the kind, said Rainsford. Oh, said the general. 
In that case. But why discuss that now? Three days hence, we can discuss it over a bottle of Veuve Clicquot. Unless... The general sipped his wine. Then a businesslike air animated him. Ivan, he said to Rainsford, will supply you with hunting clothes, food, a knife. I suggest you wear moccasins. They leave a poorer trail. I suggest, too, that you avoid the big swamp in the southeast corner of the island. We call it Death Swamp. There's quicksand there. One foolish fellow tried it. The deplorable part of it was that Lazarus followed him. You can imagine my feelings, Mr. Rainsford. I loved Lazarus. He was the finest hound in my pack. Well, I must beg you to excuse me now. I always take a siesta after lunch. You'll hardly have time for a nap, I fear. You'll want to start, no doubt. I shall not follow till dusk. Hunting at night is so much more exciting than by day, don't you think? Au revoir, Mr. Rainsford. Au revoir. General Zaroff, with a deep, courtly bow, strolled from the room. From another door came Ivan. Under one arm he carried khaki hunting clothes, a haversack of food, a leather sheath containing a long-bladed hunting knife. His right hand rested on a cocked revolver thrust in the crimson sash about his waist. Rainsford had fought his way through the bush for two hours. I must keep my nerve. I must keep my nerve, he said through tight teeth. He had not been entirely clear-headed when the chateau gate snapped shut behind him. His whole idea at first was to put distance between himself and General Zaroff and... To this end, he had plunged along, spurred on by the sharp rowels of something very like panic. Now he had got a grip on himself, had stopped, and was taking stock of himself and the situation. He saw that straight flight was futile. Inevitably, it would bring him face to face with the sea. He was in a picture with a frame of water, and his operations clearly must take place within that frame. I'll give him a trail to follow, muttered Rainsford, and he struck off from the rude paths he had been following into the trackless wilderness. He executed a series of intricate loops. He doubled on his trail again and again, recalling all the lore of the fox hunt and all the dodges of the fox. Night found him leg-weary with hands and face lashed by the branches on a thickly wooded ridge. He knew it would be insane to blunder on through the dark, even if he had the strength. His need for rest was imperative, and he thought, I have played the fox. Now I must play the cat of the fable. A big tree with a thick trunk and outspread branches was nearby, and taking care to leave not the slightest mark, he climbed up into the crotch and, stretching out on one of the broad limbs after a fashion, rested. Rest brought him new confidence and almost a feeling of security. Even so zealous a hunter as General Zaroff could not trace him there, he told himself. Only the devil himself could follow that complicated trail through the jungle after dark. But perhaps the general was a devil. An apprehensive night crawled slowly by like a wounded snake, and sleep did not visit Rainsford, although the silence of a dead world was on the jungle. Toward morning, when a dingy gray was varnishing the sky, the cry of some startled bird focused Rainsford's attention in that direction. Something was coming through the bush, coming slowly, carefully, coming by the same winding way Rainsford had come. He flattened himself down on the limb, and through a screen of leaves almost as thick as tapestry, he watched. The thing that was approaching was a man, it was General Zaroff. He made his way along with his eyes fixed in utmost concentration on the ground before him. He paused, almost beneath the tree, dropped to his knees and studied the ground. Rainsford's impulse was to hurl himself down like a panther, but he saw the General's right hand he held something metallic, a small automatic pistol. The hunter shook his head several times as if he were puzzled. 
Then he straightened up and took from his case one of his black cigarettes. Its pungent, incense-like smoke floated up to Rainsford's nostrils. Rainsford held his breath. The general's eyes had left the ground and were traveling inch by inch up the tree. Rainsford froze there, every muscle tensed for a spring. But the sharp eyes of the hunter stopped before they reached the limb where Rainsford lay. A smile spread over his brown face. Very deliberately, he blew a smoke ring into the air. Then, he turned his back on the tree and walked carelessly away, back along the trail he had come. The swish of the underbrush against his hunting boots grew fainter and fainter. Then, pent-up air burst hotly from Rainsford's lungs. His first thought made him feel sick and numb. The general could follow a trail through the woods at night. He could follow an extremely difficult trail. He must have uncanny powers. Only by the merest chance had the Cossack failed to see his quarry. Rainsford's second thought was even more terrible. It sent a shudder of cold horror through his whole being. Why had the general smiled? Why had he turned back? Rainsford did not want to believe what his reason told him was true, but the truth was as evident as the sun that had by now pushed through the morning mists. The general was playing with him. The general was saving him for another day's sport. The Cossack was the cat. He was the mouse. Then it was that Rainsford knew the full meaning of terror. I will not lose my nerve. I will not. He slid down from the tree and struck off again into the woods. His face was set, and he forced the machinery of his mind to function. Three hundred yards from his hiding place he stopped, where a huge dead tree leaned precariously on a smaller living one. Throwing off his sack of food, Rainsford took his knife from its sheath and began to work with all his energy. The job was finished at last and he threw himself down behind a fallen log a hundred feet away. He did not have to wait long. The cat was coming again to play with the mouse. Following the trail with the sureness of a bloodhound came General Zaroff. Nothing escaped those searching black eyes. No crushed blade of grass, no bent twig, no mark, no matter how faint in the moss. So intent was the Cossack on his stalking that he was upon the thing Rainsford had made before he saw it. His foot touched the protruding bow that was the trigger. Even as he touched it, the general sensed his danger and leaped back with the agility of an ape. But he was not quite quick enough. The dead tree, delicately adjusted to rest on the cut living one, crashed down and struck the general a glancing blow on the shoulder as it fell. But for his alertness, he must have been smashed beneath it. He staggered, but he did not fall, nor did he drop his revolver. He stood there, rubbing his injured shoulder, and Rainsford, with fear again gripping his heart, heard the general's mocking laugh ring through the jungle. Rainsford, called the general, if you are within the sound of my voice, as I suppose you are, let me congratulate you. Not many men know how to make a Malay man-catcher. Luckily for me, I too have hunted in Malacca. You are proving interesting, Mr. Rainsford. I'm going now to have my wound dressed. It's only a slight one, but I shall be back. I shall be back. When the general, nursing his bruised shoulder, had gone, Rainsford took up his flight again. It was flight now, a desperate, hopeless flight that carried him on for some hours. Dusk came, then darkness, and still he pressed on. The ground grew softer under his moccasins. The vegetation grew ranker, denser. Insects bit him savagely. But then, as he stepped forward, his foot sank into the ooze. He tried to wrench it back, but the muck sucked viciously at his foot as if it were a giant leech. With a violent effort, he tore loose. He knew where he was now. Death Swamp and its quicksand. 
His hands were tight closed, as if his nerve were something tangible that someone in the darkness was trying to tear from his grip. The softness of the earth had given him an idea. He stepped back from the quicksand a dozen feet or so, and, like some huge prehistoric beaver, he began to dig. Rainsford had dug himself in in France when a second's delay meant death. That had been a placid pastime compared to his digging now. The pit grew deeper. When it was above his shoulders, he climbed out and from some hard saplings cut stakes and sharpened them to a fine point. These stakes he planted in the bottom of the pit with the point sticking up. With flying fingers he wove a rough carpet of weeds and branches and with it he covered the mouth of the pit. Then, wet with sweat and aching with tiredness, he crouched behind the stump of a lightning-charred tree. He knew his pursuer was coming. He heard the padding sound of feet on the soft earth, and the night breeze brought him the perfume of the general's cigarette. It seemed to Rainsford that the general was coming with unusual swiftness. He was not feeling his way along, foot by foot. Rainsford, crouching there, could not see the general, nor could he see the pit. He lived a year and a minute. Then he felt an impulse to cry aloud with joy, for he heard the sharp crackle of the breaking branches as the cover of the pit gave way. He heard the sharp scream of pain as the pointed stakes found their mark. He leaped up from his place of concealment. Then he cowered back. Three feet from the pit, a man was standing with an electric torch in his hand. You have done well, Rainsford, the voice of the general called. Your Burmese tiger pit has claimed one of my best dogs. Again, you score. I think, Mr. Rainsford, I'll see what you can do against my whole pack. I'm going home for a rest now. Thank you for a most amusing evening. At daybreak, Rainsford, lying near the swamp, was awakened by the sound that made him know that he had new things to learn about fear. It was a distant sound, faint and wavering, but he knew it. It was the baying of a pack of hounds. Rainsford knew he could do one of two things. He could stay where he was and wait. That was suicide. He could flee. That was postponing the inevitable. For a moment, he stood there thinking. An idea that held a wild chance came to him, and, tightening his belt, he headed away from the swamp. The baying of the hounds drew nearer, then still nearer, nearer, ever nearer. On a ridge, Rainsford climbed a tree. Down a watercourse not a quarter of a mile away, he could see the bush moving. Straining his eyes, he saw the lean figure of General Zaroff. Just ahead of him, Rainsford made out another figure whose wide shoulders surged through the tall jungle weeds. It was the giant Ivan, and he seemed pulled forward by some unseen force. Rainsford knew that Ivan must be holding the pack in a leash. They would be on him any minute now. His mind worked frantically. He thought of a native trick he had learned in Uganda. He slid down the tree. He caught hold of a springy young sapling, and to it he fastened his hunting knife with the blade pointing down the trail. With a bit of wild grapevine, he tied back the sapling. Then he ran for his life. The hounds raised their voices as they hit the fresh scent. Rainsford knew now how an animal at bay feels. He had to stop to get his breath. The baying of the hounds stopped abruptly, and Rainsford's heart stopped too. They must have reached the knife. He shinned excitedly up a tree and looked back. His pursuers had stopped, but the hope that was in Rainsford's brain when he climbed died. For he saw in the shallow valley that General Zaroff was still on his feet, but Ivan was not. The knife, driven by the recoil of the springing tree, had not wholly failed. as he dashed along. A blue gap showed between the trees dead ahead. Ever nearer drew the hounds. Rainsford forced himself on toward that gap. He reached it. It was the shore of the sea. 
Across a cove, he could see the gloomy gray stone of the chateau. Twenty feet below him, the sea rumbled and hissed. Rainsford hesitated. He heard the hounds. Then he leaped far out into the sea. When the general and his pack reached the place by the sea, the Cossack stopped. For some minutes, he stood regarding the blue-green expanse of water. He shrugged his shoulders. Then he sat down, took a drink of brandy from a silver flask, lit a perfumed cigarette, and hummed a bit from Madama Butterfly. General Zarov had an exceedingly good dinner in his great paneled dining hall that evening. With it, he had a bottle of Paul Roger and half a bottle of Chambertin. Two slight annoyances kept him from perfect enjoyment. One was the thought that it would be difficult to replace Ivan. The other was that his quarry had escaped him. Of course, the American hadn't played the game, so thought the general as he tasted his after-dinner liqueur. In his library, he read to soothe himself from the works of Marcus Aurelius. At 10, he went up to his bedroom. He was deliciously tired, he said to himself as he locked himself in. There was a little moonlight, so before turning on his light, he went to the window and looked down at the courtyard. He could see the great hounds, and he called, Better luck another time, to them. Then he switched on the light. A man, who had been hiding in the curtains of the bed, was standing there. Rainsford, screamed the general. How in God's name did you get here? Swam said Rainsford. I found it quicker than walking through the jungle. The general sucked in his breath and smiled. I congratulate you, he said. You have won the game. Rainsford did not smile. I am still a beast at bay, he said in a low, hoarse voice. Get ready, General Zaroff. The general made one of his deepest bows. I see, he said. Splendid. One of us is to furnish a repast for the hounds. The other will sleep in this very excellent bed. On guard, Rainsford. He had never slept in a better bed, Rainsford decided. And what a great ending, too. Um, <clears throat> the fact that the author waits until the very second last word... We don't know who's going to win the game. Actually, it looked like uh, the game was over, like Rainsford jumped off the cliff to his own death, left far out into the sea. But as he leapt into the sea, he looked down, there were rocks there, and he thought for sure he had died. So General Zaroff went back and at dinner. Everything seemed to be very much over. Here, the action is kind of over. Um, our falling action is complete. And actually, what we get here is then a resolution. The resolution is him jumping into the sea. And then finally, the end. All of this right here, boys and girls, is called the denouement. It is the ending. And there's no real excitement here. That's very important to know. We have falling action, and that happens uh, t until, until the resolution where it's, the, the game is over. And the game is totally over when Rainsford falls into the sea. Uh, because then he, he goes back with his group, his, a pack of dogs, and he goes and have dinner. And then finally Rainsford is sitting there. Now, there's no conflict here. As a reader, are you saying to yourself, I want to know, where, how was the struggle? What was the fight like? But a good writer won't do that because in after the resolution, if you have your falling action coming down, after you get to the resolution here, anything after the denouement is supposed to be flat, and it is. And, and there's still that element of drawing out the reader until the very end because he just says, fine, you want to keep going? The game's not over yet? And you know that... Rainsford is totally mad here, right? And he's like, I'm still a beast at bay. You know, and it's like, it's just so awesome. And and basically goes, fine, unguarded Rainsford. And we don't know, Rainsford could have a, a gun behind his back. He could have a sword. He's been in his house. He got to his house before he did. So anyway, um, they, they just says, on guard, Rainsford. And then he had never slept in a better bed, Rainsford decided. We don't know that Rainsford is the winner until the second last word of the short story. Beautiful job by the author to draw out everything throughout the story and keep building suspense i i really kind of like that um three things you need to know about for class on monday 
number one, there were three pits or three traps used. It started with the Malay Man Catcher. Uh, that was one of the first ones there. So we have right here, it's actually at the top of page 26, second column. Rainsford called the general. If you're within the sound of my voice, I suppose you are. I congratulate you. Not many men know how to make a Malay Man Catcher. Luckily for you, I, or, or luckily for me, I've hunted in Malacca there. So um, he goes back and dresses his wound. All right, the next um, trap that he uses is called the Burmese Tiger Pit. And one, two things I want to point out about this. He gets down by this um, soft ground, the death swamp there. And Rainsford, it says, had dug himself in in France when a second's delay meant death. Um, what he, if you look at your book, there is a footnote at the bottom of page 26 that talks is in relation to World War I. Rainsford must have been a soldier in World War I, and he dug um, trenches for trench warfare. And what's kind of funny is, I don't know about you, but if I'm digging a trench in, 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 in a world war, I would think that's pretty dangerous and a pretty rough time. And he goes, that had been a placid pastime. A placid pastime means, uh, and I love the alliteration, placid pastime, but it's it's like a comfortable, easy, uh, easygoing, nice time that he had compared to his digging now. It's like this digging is more with fear than being in part of a world war because he's actually literally hunting by the, hunted by this this evil, evil creature. General Zaroff. So he makes this big deep pit and the next thing I want to talk about again is foreshadowing. We don't see foreshadowing until we do a rereading. Pursuers coming and he heard the padding of the sound of feet on the soft earth and the night breeze brought the perfume of the general's cigarette. It seemed to Rainsford that the general was coming with unusual swiftness. He was not feeling his way along foot by foot. Remember throughout the rest of this text he's been slowly looking for a broken branch or little subtle things to follow the path of Rainsford. He's moving with unusual swiftness. Why is he moving so fast? Why is he not looking for those small blades of grass? It's because he's being led by a dog. Um, but it's beautiful because that is foreshadowing the fact that it is not going to be Zaroff to fall into this tiger pit. He says he heard a screech, and I love, I love the descriptions because you'd think it could be Zaroff that fell in this pit. But it's the dog, watch again. He felt an impulse to cry aloud for joy when he heard the sharp crackle of the breaking branches to cover the pit that gave way. He heard a sharp scream of pain. Sounds like a human pain, but that scream is the dog, the yelp, and pointed stakes found their mark. He leaped from his place of concealment and then quick cowered back, right? Three feet from the pit, a man was still standing with an electric torch in his hand. So he's got a, basically like a flashlight there. You've done well, Rainsford. You've gotten one of my best dogs, okay? And what we get here is, again, beautiful suspense by the author, but it was foreshadowed. Did you see the foreshadowing of that? We knew that it was going to be the dog because Zaroff is moving with unusual swiftness. He was being led by a dog. So that was foreshadowed there with that and then revealed when the dog actually fell into the pit. So Burmese tiger pit was second. You got a knife trap we know doesn't get Zaroff either because the guy leading him is Ivan. So that gets Ivan. Finally, he jumps off the cliff. And we have our falling action over. Uh, one last thing I want to talk about before I wrap it up is the um, the concept of conflict. Man versus man, man versus self, man versus supernatural, man versus nature. Uh, we have a ton of different types, all the different forms of conflict in this story. Uh, we have man versus nature being the jungle, being uh, the ocean that he has to swim out of. Uh, man versus man, obviously, Zara versus Rainford. Um, and then supernatural. Do you remember where he says um, the first night he fell asleep in the tree and he never thought he could follow him unless it was the devil? Is Zaroff actually supernatural? Is there something more um, uh, wicked about him? Like is he is he partially the devil? Uh, so supernatural kind of plays into this a little bit. But it's kind of neat to see. Did you see all this? Gotta keep my nerve, nerve, nerve. The whole time he's telling himself this is man versus self in here. And only in... Uh, after the climax, everything is all man versus um, external conflict, man versus ocean, man versus jungle. We get man versus self in the falling action after the climax. And I love the way the author divides the book like that as well. Um, just a great story by Richard Connell. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please make sure you are aware of all the literary elements that I talked about, uh, which, which is um, specifically foreshadowing, irony, and, um, and definitely conflict. With, uh, we will talk about that in class as well. Um, at this time, we're all set. Please make sure you comment on this video. 
with detailed comments so that I know that you're earning two points. You will earn two points for watching each video and basically four points over this break. I hope you had a good um, holiday and I, and I wish you well. Thank you. We'll see you in class on Monday.